Student of the Game is on Patreon. If you'd like to support the channel and become a patron for as little as a dollar a month, click the link below to sign up. Okay, on to the video. In April 2023, climate scientists at Dartmouth published a study that found that global warming has been adding about 50 home runs to the overall total in Major League Baseball every year since about 2010. Warmer air means baseballs fly further, which means more home runs. But you may be wondering, because I certainly was and still kinda am, but why did they do this? What possesses someone to spend so much time and resources just to see if baseball and climate change are connected? One of those is a direct threat to the long-term health of the planet, and the other one is baseball. You could ask the same thing about why a pair of math majors at Furman did their entire two-year research project on studying shifts, or why NASA has used batted ball data to study aerodynamics. Nerds all over the world are using baseball to answer some of their biggest questions about physics, psychology, and economics. But before I tell you why, I need to back up a little bit. I recently made a video about the contract year phenomenon, which you can watch by clicking up here or at the link in the description if you feel so inclined, but just like I normally do, the first thing I did in researching that topic was to see if anyone else had looked at it. That led me to the work of Dr. Heather O'Neill, a professor emeritus of applied economics at Ursinus College in Philadelphia. Dr. O'Neill is a huge baseball fan. In addition to teaching and researching more traditional stuff in that field, she also presented research for Saber, the baseball data organization created by Bill James, and created a sports economics course for her honor students. And it was in that class that a couple of her students came to her with an idea about a project on contract years, which she saw as not only a cool idea and opportunity for them, but also for her. Whenever I said yes to a student, yes, I'll work with you, I had to make sure that I would be learning a new econometric technique in their project so that I could then use that new technique in my own research or in other classes. Dr. O'Neill and her students had a question to study and an opportunity to use a new method to study it with, but what was that method going to be? Just like I did with my analysis in that previous video, they had to decide what their research framework was going to look like. I chose to do a very simple regression that looked at the relationship between contract length and player value, but as I said at the time, that system wasn't perfect. And right away, Dr. O'Neill realized one of the main weaknesses of that approach. It was you know, kind of obvious to me that when you're looking at all these players in there, it's not just a cross-sectional thing. They do it, you know, many players over a period of time. The same players in, in your sample many, many times. And so that should be taken into account. She is absolutely right about this. Take a player like Adam Wainwright, for example, who was in our data set. Adam Wainwright's first true contract year was in 2007, meaning that in our sample, he had 13 different data points represented on the graph. Contrast that with someone like Garrett Cole, who is getting paid more, but only has three years of information represented in our data. And you begin to see a problem. Suddenly, Adam Wainwright and his decade and a half's worth of individual circumstances are making a far greater impact on our overall results than almost anyone else we looked at, which is creating a greater opportunity for bias and pulling us further away from accurately measuring what we were originally trying to study. And if you don't account for that kind of thing, you can completely undercut your entire process, no matter if you're studying baseball or something completely different. We run into this a lot of times in economics where you, you can't observe um, how smart somebody is. Okay, you can use IQ as a measure, but mm, but some people are just, you know, they're born with more up there than other people. Yeah, they've got that. And yet, when people try to look at how education affects earnings, you know, they, they come up with biased results because what's happening is that that stuff you're not observing, okay, that you can't capture is affecting education, which is then affecting earnings. Dr. O'Neill and her students wanted to be a little bit more precise in how they went about defining and then isolating the contract year phenomenon. But luckily for them, Dr. O'Neill was not the only person in her family looking into this kind of thing. I had a daughter who was actually doing a, a research paper time, you'd be interested in this, on how a quarterback's uh, appearance, okay, how good looking they are. And that's measured biologically by the uh, you know, the percentage of pixels that are symmetric or something in their face. Um, and seeing how that affects how much money they make. Mm -hmm. And there's been lots of stuff written in that. And I kept arguing with her saying, you can't run an OLS. You, you have this one guy in there, let's say Tom Brady, you have him in there for 20 years and his looks haven't changed. I mean, his fundamental, you know, symmetry in space. You ask yourself, what are the time invariant parts about a person? 
time invariant. Mm -hmm. So uh, your work ethic, your talent level, your coordination, um, things like that, that, that it's like what you're born with. Well, those are things that aren't changing in a person. Yeah. Similar to the, to the football players, the symmetry of their face doesn't change. They can get fatter or skinnier, but symmetry isn't changing. So what you want to do is, is ask yourself, are those things that we, that we don't capture, are they impacting the variables that we are collecting data on? The answer to that question is probably yes, which is something that we also talked about in our analysis. So to try and eliminate that kind of thing as a source of error, one potential solution is to compare players to their own averages rather than comparing them directly to other players. You really have to think about the players and say, okay, let's just look at them within themselves. Mm. I have 10 years of data on OPS on this player. What was his average OPS over the 10 years? And then what was the deviation in year one from the average, year two from the average, right? Mm -hmm. So you can look at the deviations in his, in his numbers. And so what you're actually doing is running regression on those deviations mm -hmm. and seeing whether or not the deviation is really positive on a contract year. This type of analysis is known as a fixed effects model, where a researcher can control for an individual's unique immeasurable characteristics, like talent or work ethic, by isolating them within their own mini data set. If we're measuring Adam Wainwright's motivation against that of Garrett Cole, both of which are individual to those players, we would need to be able to accurately and quantitatively account for them. But if we measure them against their own average, we don't have to do that anymore. And based on that model, there is a statistically significant effect on players in their contract years, as well as a drop-off once they've gotten that big contract. Now, why would their results have been different from the ones we got? Well, for one thing, we used completely different methodologies. I ran what's known as an analysis of variance, or an ANOVA, and they used a fixed effects model. They only used data from a specific collective bargaining agreement, whereas I used all the data I had available to me from that time period. I used war as my dependent variable because I wanted an accumulation stat that would account for a player's defensive ability, but they used OPS, or OPS+. Neither of those methods are right or wrong, they're just assessing different things at different levels but they can both be used to analyze the massive amounts of baseball data available to anyone with a web browser. Which brings me back to my initial question. Why are so many academics using baseball as their sandbox to test their theories about other stuff? Well, first of all, because baseball is cool, and don't let anyone tell you differently. But also because of something Dr. O'Neill said herself. If there's a way to examine data that you've never tried before, baseball is the perfect place to test it out, because there's just so much information available. You can take a qualitative idea like motivation or work ethic and test it in a quantitative way, which is extremely appealing for someone in a field like Heather's. As an economist, you know, I, I could say that people up for tenure, okay, going on the tenure track, they're going to, oh my God, they're six year, they're going to go nuts trying to, you know, get tenure. Or somebody who's going to become a CEO of a corporation, yeah, they're going to bust their butt until they get to the, the promised land. I can't measure that. I can't measure output of professors. I can't, it's not public, publicly available data. I can't do that with CEOs you know, too, too easily. So baseball is just this treasure trove of data. And that's why economists use it all the time. Because I can observe all kinds of what would normally be private transactions. Yeah. You know, a contract, what's in the contract, how much you're getting paid. I don't know what you get paid. You know what I get paid. That, that's, that's like private. Baseball, we know it all. What we're getting at here is an interesting subsection of this field called behavioral economics, where psychology and economic theory meet to try and explain or predict behavior. And sports sit right there in the middle of both of them. If you wanted to try and guess how a company's production might be affected by a change in management or ownership, you could look at a team's win-loss record or player efficiency in response to something similar. If you wanted to study global warming, you could see how much it correlates to something that people are familiar with and can understand, like home runs, the data for which will be both abundant and easy to access. If you're a national space agency that doesn't want to disclose its research on sensitive things like interplanetary travel, you can study things like the aerodynamics of baseball that you don't feel worried telling people about. I've always been a little annoyed by people who dismiss sports as a viable and legitimate thing to study, because as I found through building this channel and doing my own research over the years, it so totally is. Social theory, politics, economics, physics, it's all here if you know where to look. 
Doing these videos on contract theory and talking to Dr. O'Neill just solidified that idea for me, as well as the notion that baseball is the perfect sport for nerds. Because of the incredible amount of information available from baseball's entire 150 year history, you can get about as deep into the weeds as you could possibly want to go, and that's only going to increase as more and more things about the game get tracked. So if you're an aspiring researcher, or a doctoral student, or a teacher, or whatever who's trying to answer a big question, you could do a lot worse than testing on Major League Baseball. Because believe me, you wouldn't be the first person to try that, and you absolutely will not be the last. Hi everybody! Congratulations on making it to the end screen. It means a lot. They don't take that long to make or anything, but it does make me happy to have a few people still here to see them. A little bit of a different type of episode this week, but I always enjoy getting to talk to actual experts, and then getting to share those insights with y'all. Dr. O'Neill was one of my favorite interviews I've done for this channel so far, and while she was featured pretty heavily in the episode, you can find the entire interview on my Patreon page, which you can sign up for by clicking on the link in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please do give it a like and subscribe to the channel for more stuff like it. Until next time, I'm Will, and this is Student of the Game. See you later!